Welcome to Sunrise. Our top story today, children as young as 13 tasered by police. Sky News reveals that young children and people in their 70s have been hit by police officers firing tasers in the last three years. An investigation gets underway into the deaths of three British tourists after their car plunged off a bridge in Iceland. Jeremy Corbyn calls for MPs to cut short their Christmas break to vote on Theresa May's Brexit plan. From villain to hero, the former inmate and drug user who's helping those in need in his hometown. At 8.45, we'll be looking through the papers of writer Mo Lovett and philosopher Dr Piers Beth. Very good morning. Thanks for joining us here on Sunrise today. Children as young as 13 have been shot by police officers using taser stun guns. Yes, the Sky News Freedom of Information request shows that among hundreds of people hit by the 50,000 volt stun guns, there were children, pensioners, including a man aged 77, and dozens of dogs. Now, the police say the decision to use tasers is never taken lightly, but campaign groups want the use of tasers against children to be banned. Sky's Phil Edwards has been following this story for us. Tell us a bit about the numbers here, Phil. Yeah, it's come from, as you say, a freedom of information request, but also Home Office statistics, which show a sharp increase in the number of occasions that tasers are used on the streets of, of this country. In the 12 months to April of this year, they were drawn by officers on 17,000 occasions and actually fired, discharged, on 2,000 occasions. But it's the age of the intended targets that are of most interest to us. Uh, one of 13 year old boy on Merseyside. There was also a 14-year-old girl threatening to harm herself with a machete in Cumbria. It's not just the young, it's the elderly as well. A 77-year-old man tasered in 2016 by the Metropolitan Police. Other forces to have used tasers on people in their 70s include Kent, Hampshire and the West Midlands. Now, this has concerned civil liberties campaigners, as you might imagine. We can hear from one now. Police officers need tools, but they also need to use them responsibly because police officers, although they have a very dangerous job, they also have a lot of power, including the power to use force that normal people aren't allowed to use. And so when we see those statistics that show how frequently these weapons are being used and the circumstances, <clears throat> all too frequent circumstances in which they're being used inappropriately, I think we have to ask ourselves whether we've, we're moving too quickly. Now, it's not just people. They've been used to these tasers on animals, uh, specifically dangerous dogs, 37 times. Uh, PETA, the Animal Welfare Group, have said they're concerned about this because these tasers are designed to take down an adult. If you use them on a dog, they're 50,000 volts, don't forget, that can prove fatal. It has proved fatal. Now, the police say they always try to take into account the age of the people they're using these uh, stun guns on. But they say officers in the real world sometimes have a split second to to make the decision, do I pull that trigger or don't I? OK, Phil, thanks for following that story for us this morning. Well, also this morning, investigation has now been launched after three Britons, including a young child, died after the vehicle crashed whilst crossing a bridge in Iceland. Seven British tourists were travelling in the 4x4 when it crashed onto the rocks. Other passengers were critically injured. Local media reports say that the people in the car were two British brothers, their wives and children. Sky's James Matthews reports. First pictures of the crash scene show the wreckage of the jeep beneath the bridge. It had fallen 20 feet onto a dry riverbed with morning when it was dark. Police say temperatures were around freezing at the time, but say it's unclear at this stage what caused the driver to lose control. James Matthews, Sky News. Jeremy Corbyn has called on the Prime Minister to bring MPs back early from their Christmas break so that they can vote on her Brexit deal as soon as possible. Now, MPs are due to return to Westminster on the 7th of January, but the Labour leader wants Theresa May to bring that date forward. Well, our political correspondent, Laura Bunduk, joins us now from Westminster. Good morning to you, Laura. Uh, tell us more about this, then. Yeah, well, Jeremy Corbyn in an interview saying basically he wants MPs to have that meaningful vote on... Then he is very prepared to trigger that vote of no confidence in the government, which could, in effect, start proceeding towards a general election. OK, Laura, thank you. Newly declassified files released under the 30-year rule revealed the depth of anger in Westminster after the brutal deaths of two undercover soldiers in Northern Ireland, with calls at the time for troops to be pulled out of Belfast. We can speak to our Ireland correspondent, David Blevins, who's in Belfast for us. Tell us... Jerry Adams to the United States. David, thanks for all that. 
Thousands more prisoners are to have phones installed in their cells as the government attempts to tackle reoffending and violence. 50 jails across England and Wales will have in-cell phones by March 2020 at a cost of £10 million. And the measure aims to combat the use of illegal mobile phones and help rehabilitation by enabling prisoners to stay in touch with members of their family. Enabling prisoners to call a, 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 a pre-approved list of numbers, uh, phone calls which are recorded, so if there is anything that happens uh, there, for, you know, if they're misused, uh, we have the evidence. Maintaining uh, those links, and, and these are calls which the prisoner has to pay for as well, uh, I think that is a sensible and pragmatic approach to maintain those family ties to help reduce the risk of reoffending, because of course that's how we can bring down crime. The US Coast Guard says that the search for a missing British cruise ship entertainer has been suspended. 20-year-old Aaron Ho reportedly went overboard in the early hours of Christmas Day. The Coast Guard says it searched the Atlantic Ocean for more than 80 hours, covering nearly 4,000 square miles. And now this is an incredible story. How about a plane spotter from Sheffield? He changed the plans of the US President Donald Trump. Uh, let's tell you why. Eagle-eyed Alan Malloy took this photo of Air Force One as it flew high over Sheffield on Boxing Day. He tweeted it and the help with other plane enthusiasts. They worked out who was on board and where it was heading. President Trump was flying to Iraq under a false call for a top-secret visit to American troops. But the photo blew his cover and the White House had to announce his visit early to the world's media. Incredible. Best laid plans, eh? Now, almost half of smokers don't know that vaping poses much lower health risks than cigarettes, according to Public Health England. Yeah, smoking still remains the biggest cause of preventable deaths, with 78,000 every single year. So are e-cigarettes the easiest and healthiest way to help people quit? Well, here to talk about this in a bit more detail is the director of the UK Vaping Industry Association, John Dunn. Very good morning to morning. you. Morning. Uh, imagine you welcome the fact that they're saying that, you know, it's a healthy way to quit. But there is mixed information, isn't there? I remember a bit of research a few months back from Birmingham University. I think they were warning that you know, it can actually still be dangerous to people. I think there's a lot of misapprehension uh, about uh, the safety of vaping. Nobody is saying that vaping is 100% safer, but what we do know is that when you compare it to smoking, it's at least 95% safer. Are you surprised, though, that lots of people don't actually know that mm. it's safer? Well, what's actually surprising is that that's, that number is getting worse. Um, if you go back and look over 2013 to 2017, um, those amount of people who think that vaping is at least as safe or even uh, 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 worse than smoking has actually quadrupled over the last five years, which is the wrong way to go. So obviously this type of report goes a long way to reversing that. How have you gauged the reaction of the sort of health agencies in this country? Looking at the advice from um, British Heart Foundation, they said they would not advise non-smokers to take up e-cigarettes, but they can be a useful tool for harm reduction and to stop smoking. And broadly, that's the consensus, isn't it? Has it taken a long time to get to that point? It, it has. Um, but I think the UK stands out um, around the world as being the proponent of, of vaping as part of their smoking cessation uh, um, strategy. So if you look at um, uh, Stoptober, for instance, this year, uh, which is the Public Health England Stop Smoking campaign, this was the first year that they had featured vaping as part of that campaign. So that's a major step. Um, um, but w we're very different here in this country when you look at what's happening, say, in the US, um, where they take a very different view on nicotine consumption versus smoking, whereas here we look at smoking cessation uh, versus the consumption of nicotine. Do you think that um, other countries broadly, to put it bluntly, have it wrong? Just looking at the list, vaping is illegal in Argentina, Brazil, Brunei, Cambodia, Egypt, India, Indonesia, Jordan, Levin, I could go on. I, I, I think they do, um, in all honesty. As I said, nobody's saying that it's 100% safer, but what we do know is that when it's compared to smoking, it's, it's far better for you to use uh, vapor. And how about when it's compared to things like patches, gum? Um, what we find actually is that when you compare it to patches and gum, um, the success rate of smokers quitting using vaping is far higher using vaping than it is using those other methods. But do you think with vaping it's becoming a bit of a fad at the moment? It's actually a bit cool to vape it seems and is that a worry 
when people start to think in that way? Well, I think, I, I think if you look at social media, there, there is a, a subset of vapours that you see with these larger devices, you know, creating clouds and things like that. Um, and that's more of a lifestyle choice. But many vapours do it very discreetly and you'd hardly even know they were doing it. Um, and I think one of the, the, the challenges in this, uh, this country is there's still 7 million people that are smoking. And they're of the, the um, older demographic. So they're the ones that we need to be convincing to make that change. Um, but... However, the industry <laughs> won't be unhappy about the fact that some people who are non-smokers may choose to, you know, it's, an, it's a billion pound industry. So you as an industry won't be turning people away. Well, you've, the UK has a lot of robust um, legislation in place. We, we have not seen really an, an uptake in non-smokers taking up vaping. Um, and the um, uh, agencies like ASH have been tracking that for many years. So we really don't see that okay. um, um, cropping up in the UK. John, thank you very much for coming in to speak to us. Appreciate you. your time this morning. Yes, yeah, still to come, we've got all the latest sport with Jamie. Thank you. Yes, goals and reaction to come as West Ham move into the top half of the Premier League. Welcome back. Let's get a check now on all the latest sport with Jamie. Thank you very much. Good morning again. West Ham manager Manuel Pellegrini says he wants the side to carry on their winning mentality into Tizard, but I'm sure he'll still be celebrating today. Jamie, thank you for that. Do stay with us here on Sunrise this morning. Still to come. At 8.45, we'll be looking through the papers with writer Mo Lovett and philosopher Dr Piers Ben. Quarter past nine, we will speak to a solicitor specialising in human rights cases about coercive behaviour. Police are calling it a lesser-known side of domestic abuse. And at 20 to 10, Mountaineer and, all, of all things, former taxman Mick Fowler will be here to tell us why he dreams about climbing every mountain. And if there's anything you want to get in touch with us this morning, email news at sky.com to have your say. We were talking about vaping earlier on, obviously talking about coercive behaviour in the next hour or so. You can tweet us as well, at Sky News Tom, at Rebecca TV News, to join us this morning. Let's get a check on the weather now, shall we, with Et Nas. Good morning. It's looking mild for the rest of this year. As well as that, we're looking at mostly fine and settled conditions across many central and southern areas, although generally speaking, it's going to be a rather cloudy affair for the next few days. Welcome back to Sunrise this morning. A reminder of our top story, children as young as 13 have been shot by police officers using taser stun guns. Yes, a Freedom of Information request by Sky News has found that police in England and Wales have used uh, the 50,000 volt guns on more than 2,000 occasions over the last two years. Police say their use is never taken lightly. Among those targeted were children and pensioners, including a man aged 77, whilst they were also used on 37 times against dangerous dogs. Police officers need tools, but they also need to use them responsibly because police officers, although they have a very dangerous job, they also have a lot of power, including the power to use force that normal people aren't allowed to use. And so when we see those statistics that show how frequently these weapons are being used and the circumstances, <clears throat> all too frequent circumstances in which they're being used inappropriately, I think we have to ask ourselves whether we've, we're moving too quickly. Some breaking news to bring you from the city this morning concerning HMV. We can speak to our city editor, Mark Kleinman. Mark, what's the situation with them? Christmas trading environment for high street retailers. And what I can reveal this morning is that HMV, Britain's biggest high street music retailer, is on the brink of collapsing into administration for the second time in six years. Now, an announcement about KPMG's appointment as the administrator to HMV could come as soon as today. And as I understand it, that would threaten uh, the jobs of about 2,200 people who work for the chain. HMV currently operates from about 130 stores across the UK. And as I say, this will be the second time in six years that HMV has filed for administration. Uh, the music uh, retailing sector on the high street has been hard hit by the rise of digital streaming services. HMV was bought out of administration by an investment firm called Hilco in April uh, 2013 and since then seems to have revived its fortunes to some extent by closing less profitable stores. But as I say, I understand that trading has been so tough that Hilco has decided now that it has no option but to call in uh, administrators. Uh, I'm afraid to say it won't be the last 
such news that we hear from the high street after a Christmas trading period, which was marked by heavy discounting, uh, heavy promotional activity with uh, Christmas sales really undermined by uh, the promotional activity we saw on Black Friday uh, last month. Um, we'll have more news on this later uh, this morning, no doubt. But as I say, HMV, uh, Britain's biggest high street music retailer, is on the brink of collapse. Mark, thanks for bringing us that breaking news. As Mark said, I'm sure there'll be plenty more and reaction as well through the rest of the morning and the rest of the day here on Sky News to that breaking news. Now, he was once the UK's fifth most wanted man who spent his life high on drugs and getting involved in crime. Twenty years later, the man known as Big John is to be found in Somerset helping people on the streets going through tough times themselves. Yes, his own change of direction enables him to help others as an outreach worker because he understands exactly what they're going through. I went to Western Supermare to meet him. My name is Big John. I was once a notorious criminal from North London. I'm now in recovery helping as many people as I can. He spent more than a decade in prison. All John knew was drugs and crime. I've done all sorts of crime, from fraud and burglary to armed robbery. I've been arrested for everything from murder to drunk and disorderly. But now he's back out on the streets, helping others. Just to keep dry, I suppose, isn't it? I'll sleep down there, John. Darren, like John once was, is addicted and homeless. And at Christmas time, everything feels so much worse. I uh, just want to block it out with drugs, to be quite honest. It's, I don't want to feel. That's why, I, me personally at the moment, that's why I'm taking drugs. I don't want to feel the emotion. But to be quite honest, I had a good job, three bedroom house, car, everything. Everything that a normal person would wish for. And it's now, now I'm on the street living in the toilet, so it's kind, of, it's kind of hard really to take. It kind of makes me kind of a little bit emotional, to be quite honest. This was Big John in the 90s. Back in 2005, he was released after spending a decade in prison and he came here to Broadway Lodge in Western Supermare to try and get clean. I was spending thousands of pounds a day. You know, crack cocaine was, was, was my main addiction, but I'll take it absolutely anything. You know, I'm quite unruly, I'm quite aggressive, I'm quite violent, you know, and, 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 I, and I say this, every day that I was incarcerated, I used drugs, so prison didn't work for me. But thousands of people have been helped at Broadway Lodge over the years. This group are battling with alcohol addiction, and the festive period's likely to be their biggest test yet. All right, darling? Yeah. Big John helps people here like Trisha and Steve, who are both alcoholics. Hey, people used to say to me, why don't you get up and have a cup of coffee in the morning? So you get the mug down, get the jar of coffee, by the time you get to the cup, there's nothing left on the spoon. It's all over the side. So you try again, same again. So give up with this, I'll go and have a vodka. How much were you drinking? I mean, talk us through it. Two, two litres of vodka every day. Drink until I wasn't capable anymore. Sleep, sleep it off. Wake up whatever time in the night or whatever time in the morning and then start again. What's happening? You right, Hello, Mark. Mark. See you, mate. You all right? Big John's helped so many people that he's well recognised in Western Supermare. He certainly committed some horrific crimes, but he says helping those in trouble is his way of showing remorse. You're watching Sunrise still to come. We've got the review of the morning's papers with writer and researcher Mo Lovett and, of course, philosopher Dr. Piers Ben. Welcome back to Sunrise, one last time through your morning papers with writer and researcher Mo Lovett and philosopher Dr Piers Ben. Welcome back. Uh, just before we look at the newspapers, just we were talking in the break there about our breaking news. Sky Source is telling us that HMV is on the brink of administration, Mo. Not, as Mark Kleinman was saying, not a mm. massive surprise, but still sad because there's thousands of jobs at risk. Yeah, absolutely. It's always, I mean, this is part of the death of the high street kind of um, thing that we're hearing so much about. Um, I have so many uh, nostalgic memories of HMV yeah. growing up in the 80s and going there yeah, to get my, my vinyl and my CDs. Although a couple of years ago, I did make the mistake of buying the younger members of my family CDs for Christmas <laughs> and they, they sort of laughed uh, at me for, for, you know, we just download our stuff now, so I suppose it's no surprise in a way. But yeah, but they were in trouble about six years ago. They, they were. were. Yeah. In administration six years ago as well and then got, got out of it, but seemingly back in a pretty yeah. precarious situation. Yeah. I still go in there to buy vinyl though, maybe not CDs anymore. There's something them, but nice vinyl. about that tactile yeah. experience of going buying buying your records and your music that I don't think you get. And vinyl's coming back as well. 
which yeah. is quite heartening, yeah. I think. Yeah. Uh, right, let's turn our attention to the papers then, uh, starting with the front page of the Times, Mo. <laughs> these uh, National Archives, this National Archives release of um, papers and uh, quite a funny one on the front page of the yeah, Times. Yeah, talking about digital and, and kind of moving into the uh, new era. So this was released, this is from uh, the Tony Blair's uh, uh, time in office when um, uh, Number 10 advisors um, said, um, we might have to catch up with this internet business if we're <laughs> going to kind of stay ahead of the curve and appear to be modern kind of new labour. Um, so there was some kind of discussion about, you know, how they keep up to date with internet and email, plus the suggestion that we might open up the opportunity for people to email the Prime Minister. So what is email? <laughs> <laughs> You're not that a bit old. late to the bar. Um, <laughs> but they said, oh, there might be an initial flurry of people wanting to, it's a bit of a novel thing to be able to email your um, your PM, so it might be an initial flurry, but it'll never catch on. How wrong they were. Yeah. Yes, I like it. I'm sure we should offer the chance to email the Prime Minister in time, but I'm cautious about rushing into it. We wouldn't get a huge amount of them in the long run. Imagine if they had opened that email inbox. <laughs> yeah, they'd get yeah, quite a lot. Imagine? But it did explode very quickly. It's about 1995. Okay, I'm just about old enough to remember that. That all of a sudden everybody was talking about email, and John yeah. Humphreys on the Today Program was saying you can email the program. It was then a sudden I explosion. Loved, I loved it. I think that's yeah. that's a really interesting thing about reading this article. These mm. notes about advice on email and yeah. internet. 1994. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it, that wasn't that long ago. It seems well, strange they? to think yeah. 1994 they were yeah. having conversations about. Should we even get email in that, number 10? Yeah, even when I went to university, nobody had laptops. That only came later. It feels weird now to think that I lived without a laptop. I, I How know. do I survive? I can't even remember <laughs> surviving without it, you know. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah. It, uh, it feels longer ago than yes. it actually was. <laughs> yeah. um, Piers, Guardian, yes. something to do with exa the exam system in schools. What's From university on? to exams, yes. Well, The Guardian uh, has an article on the former head of the civil service saying that the exam system fuels anxiety crisis. Um, interesting. I think there are two... There, this could be split up into two different bits, I think. There's the obsession with exams that I think he's right to point out. But there's also the mental health crisis that people are talking about a lot among young people. I think that it's right to worry about the obsession with exams. I think that um, the history of this is that in the late 90s, around the time an email exploded into the scene, <laughs> uh, Tony Blair got into power and David Blunkett, the Education Secretary, suddenly panicked that they, they thought that British school children could no longer read or write. And so they suddenly had these literacy hours and numeracy hours and all this regimented kind of education. And this went on with the, the, the obsession with examin examining everything. So you spend all your time preparing for examination. That, I think, is a terrible thing. It's a reaction to a sort of alleged progressivism of the 1960s and 70s, but it's an overreaction. But the other side is the mental health crisis. Now, I think there is something to this. I think there's some evidence that the use of smartphones and online bullying has contributed to this. At the same time, I do suspect, and I have no evidence here, so I'll be taken up on this, that um, these things like stress are being over-medicalised. Mm -hmm. They are, to, to an extent, being over-diagnosed. Um, mm -hmm. That, you know, whereas in the past you had this an ordinary stress, not nice, but you get over it, your character's formed. Now some people are saying, I'm mentally ill because I'm worried. But there's so much more to education than just the well, you know, written examination. How about sport and the extracurricular? I and also sport, just the joy of learning. I think yeah. that's something that we have stopped yeah. squeezed out of education a little bit. Yeah. But I think the thing is, we, we, uh, there was an interesting editorial in The Times yesterday about how you know, we talk about the kind of cultural wars and around Brexit and the divide that's happening in the country. And actually about 50% of young people now are educated to higher education standards yes. and 50% aren't and that's causing this massive divide yeah. and, um, and and so I think what we're doing is we're placing far more emphasis on the qualification yes. and the fact that you've been educated um, yes. in a certain way rather than yeah, and you yeah. know so parents want their kids to go to university because they think it's going to be the best opportunity yeah. and all the rest of it. And so you get caught in the trap because it may, yeah. I mean, the more people go to university the less value a degree might have. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean that's not the whole story but that's I mean Tony Blair sold this mm -hmm. and I think it's, it's rebounding a bit. Let's look at this next story, shall we, Mo, in the Times, page four. Um, obviously, with the whole issue at Gatwick over Christmas, which yes. caused chaos for so many people uh, and their holidays, we need to up our game on tackling drones. That's according to the Met Chief. Yeah, so Cressida Dick, uh, Met Chief, has um, said we really do need to up our game on the illegal use of drones. And like you say, this comes on the back of the, uh, the Gatwick shutdown over Christmas or just before Christmas. We still don't actually know what's going on. No. No. And and the article does say um, that uh, the police are not going to release their update on where we are with the investigation. Mm. There's clearly a little bit more to this than meets the eye. Was it a bird? Was it a drone? We don't know, do we? Um, but I think what surprised me about this story is 
We had, you know, a few years ago issues with illegal use of drones and when yeah. Amazon started using them to drop off your presents at your door and all the rest of it. So we knew drone technology was on our doorstep, literally. Um, we knew um, that, you know, the technology was going to be improving. Why are we only now starting to think about the illegal use of drones? Mm. To me, it seems a bit like on the back foot, really. A few people have pointed out the fact that, and, and the police at the time said there are huge complications with trying to shoot these down and, and you know, it's reading a bit about that. So it's, it's obviously there are complications with just simply blowing stuff out the sky yeah. at the same time you can't imagine something like this happening at some airports maybe in the US certainly places like Ben Gurion and Israel if there was a drone over the runway you just don't think it would be and what should we do for yes. hours and hours and indeed yeah. days there must be yeah. something that the yeah. maybe our authorities aren't aren't looking at that other countries would do or have have the ability but to there's do. also brief speculation that there was no drone at all That's right. and uh, it, that calls to mind other occasions when people there's been a, a, a widespread belief in something unreal like alien spacecraft in the 1940s as soon as somebody announces something everybody starts seeing it yet it may be completely fictitious yeah. The drone, I don't know whether it was. Conscious maybe. bias or whatever totally, it, yeah, well, it's uh, called. Uh, Communal reinforcement. And uh, so you, related to the, your previous story, Piers, as yeah. well, as the, the Lord O'Donnell who was talking about the education changes, yeah. just like this, legislation, people calling for legislation, but as pointed out by Lord O'Donnell, there's no time for legislation at the moment yeah. because everything yeah, is everything taken up by Brexit. Up yes, Brexit. Yes, indeed, and yeah. also, I suppose I'm being a little bit unfair that we know that police um, and other emergency services are suffering from lack of funding, so I suppose it's been able to invest in mm. preparing yeah. for the future, isn't it? Yes. Uh, moving on to weather appears yes. in the eye. It has been some year, 2018, hasn't it, for weather and uh, what's it effect, its effect on wildlife? Yes, um, I'm put to shame by this article, this piece in the eye, because all kinds of um, rare species are mentioned that I, as a, a townie and a Londoner, uh, mm -hmm. I'm, only, I'm sort of not particularly well acquainted with. Um, all kinds of species and all kinds of habitats are being apparently uh, altered by harsh extremes of weather. and. Um, the, under, the, the subtext of this is climate change and anthropogenic climate change. Mm. And I suppose that the question it raises, I mean, from a very abstract ethical point of view, is um, I don't want to shock anybody, but does it actually matter if species go out of existence? I mean, what's so important about the existence of the species? I think the answer must be it must be good for the, the, the ecosystem as a whole. Um, but then, you know, but we, I think it, there, there's a lot of environmental philosophy going on. It's been going for about 40 years and a huge question to ask about it. And climate change, I think, is now accepted as being very largely anthropogenic, except by a few sort of contrarians. Mm. Um, and so we do face a genuine question about um, how we balance our different priorities and how we move forward and how we respect nature and the environment. Yeah, possibly the biggest question for our future, isn't it? <laughs> Along with everything else we talk about in paper reviews. Um, let's move on to this one then, shall we? Which always uh, gets a big, big reaction. Hospital parking charges. They've I mean, gone up again, haven't they? Yeah, they, 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 they've gone up again this year. Um, I think 43% of health trusts have announced that um, a press association have done an investigation mm. under Freedom of Information Act. And 43% of health trusts have increased their parking charges this year from... I, w I wasn't going to single out a particular trust because actually not everybody responded to the Freedom of Information yeah. Act, so it seems a bit wrong to kind of name them and shame them. But from around about £3.50 an hour to £8 mm. an hour, which is scandalous. I remember doing um, this story last year, actually. Mm. It comes up every year. I, I, mean, I think the reason that it really yeah. upsets people is that because, especially if you go to A&E, which is quite often the way I, I end up yeah. in the hospital taking somebody to A&E, mm. is you might not have changed in your car, you might yeah. have forgotten your phone or, or whatever, and so you're going to have to get your person inside the hospital as quickly as possible, mm. come back to a parking ticket. I think the general public are pretty good at accepting we've managed through austerity, we're not happy about it, we've kind of buttoned down we now know carrier bags are going up for it by another five pence. But this just feels like the straw that breaks the Who are the robbery. worst performing ones? Let, let's I wasn't going to yeah. name and shame. Will, you want me to? Shame. Okay. Um, so, um, gosh, I don't know if I've even got the. Um, uh, Shrewsby and Telford Ooh. Hospital Trust, they've gone up from four fifty to £8. Yeah. Sorry, I said per hour. It's what for a five want? hour stay. Um, who else? Um, University Hospital of Leicester, 13% But increase. of course, I mean, health trusts would say that their budgets are being slashed elsewhere. This is a way for them to plug holes yeah. in their budgets that have been decimated in recent years. <laughs> and, and, and on the politician's side, you know, even at the bottom of this story, we've got a selection of cro park 
politicians from cross party, Theresa May, Andy Burnham, Jeremy Hunt, David Cameron, all saying we'll do all we possibly can to reduce parking charges. Nothing has been done Nothing. and mm -hmm. surely as the budgets have been cut, hospitals will say, but we need to get the money. And it's not all going back into the health service. If it was going to be reinvested in the health service, then I think perhaps people would swallow it a bit more. Yes. But, um, you know, um, pre-tax profits of 9.8 million, one hospital trust mm. is kind of, or the, sorry, the private company associated with the trust is reported. And at a hospital, they're captive parkers. Mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Mm. Um, let's have a quick look at the sport back pages. Jamie's been looking at the papers, ah. papers, papers <laughs> for us. Still that time of morning. Jamie, what's going on in the papers? <laughs> <laughs> this is the story in the Times this morning that Inter Milan will play two games behind closed doors. That's in the last couple of months. Yeah, sad to see that. Jamie, thanks for following that story for us. Let's have a quick look at two more stories. Mo. Kind of a shame, really, this story you picked out about mobile library. It is. A <coughs> pop-up library in Cumbria, um, just outside Barrow Island Primary School. Give them a little plug. Um, and they uh, found out they had a, a pop-up library and they had a look at what the figures were for the entire year and they found that only 18 books had been taken out. Mm. But when they looked at who'd taken those books out, it was all every single one of them, IT staff, just testing whether the technology was actually Not a working. single person Not had taken out a single book. person. Mm. And sad, isn't it? it is sad, and there's a nostalgia element, element mm. to libraries, and, um, you know, especially if you're working class, it's where you yeah. went to borrow yeah. your books and learn to read and all that sort of thing. However, I do think kids do find other ways to enjoy literature and, and read. And you think so? Uh, yeah, I, I do. I mean, book sales have gone up. Yeah. Um, liter literacy, yeah, literacy yeah. I know we complain about it, but there are, you know, in order to access online information, you need to be able to read. Yeah. And you know what? What um, you know? What anybody who's involved in literary studies will tell you is, kids want to read because they want to find out yeah. stuff. It's not just about uh, the get fact Kindles well, now. I, I'm yeah, also exactly. worried about the decline of public libraries. Public libraries were an important part of my childhood. My mother was very keen on them. I remember the smell of the vinyl yes. and the books and mm -hmm. the way you got them out. And but is it just nostalgia? Is my I, don't, I don't think it is. In fact, I mean, even from a practical point of view, books are incredibly clever inventions. They're much less cumbersome than these what tablet devices, whatever. <laughs> you have to keep recharging and so on. Oh, well, it's nice to have a bookshelf, isn't yes. it? Yeah, I, yes. I agree. How about this? Uh, young people yeah. hooked Literally, on knitting, and this doesn't surprise this is a great me. Link. A great link, yes. According to the Telegraph, what else? Young fogies are hooked <laughs> on knitting. Uh, apparently, uh, the, this generation of young fogies prefer knitting hardbacks and fruit picking as four in five ditch reading on tablets. Yes, well, I'm not sure how reliable. I, I've never, never done any sort of uh, anecdote based surveys as if young fogies. Certainly, 30 years ago, um, young fogies were, were, were doing something else, dressed in 2D, <coughs> three piece suits and so on. But I suppose that if you have to use your spare time, you might somehow you have to you, you have to be useful Do, and why not knit doesn't surprise me there is a there's a trend for amongst certain younger people i think for that kind of Quite a lifestyle. I want mm. to sit down and knit. I want to do some, as it says, crosswords, gardening, knitting, yeah, fishing. I think there's definitely right. movement there. Yeah. A friend of yeah. mine who knits tells me the best way to not have somebody sit next to you on the train is to get your knitting out. Oh, <laughs> if you avoid, think, you like I think there are other ways. <laughs> uh, no Mo Piers, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much for coming Thank in to speak to us this morning, having a look through your papers. Uh, let's have a quick look at the weather. Here's Nat. Stay with us here on Sunrise at the top of the hour. We'll tell you more about being tasered at 13 years old. That's the youngest victim stunned by police in England and Wales.